The 2024 U.S. presidential cycle has been nothing short of a spectacle, but they do have centuries of history to draw upon. This week, the Democrats held their national convention, with which they not only made themselves seen and heard, they were felt. But what does it say of the state of our political parties, if anything? Yeah! Ladies and gentlemen, it was a sight to behold. Kevin Harris for the most fashionable the event of the American election season so far. The Democratic Party putting on a show as they formally unveiled. Everybody over here, say comma. Everybody over here, say la. Together. Kamala Harris and running mate Tim Waltz as their nominees for the presidential election in November. The sheer star power alone was blinding. For years, Donald Trump did everything in his power to try to make people fear us. See, his, his limited, narrow view of the world made him feel threatened by the existence of two hardworking, highly educated, successful people who happen to be black. the job he's currently seeking might just be one of those black jobs. But aside from the solidarity on display, it showed the transfer of power within the Democratic Party through the decades. In recent history, from the Clintons thank you, thank you. to the Obamas, this convention has always been pretty good to kids with funny names who believe in a country where anything is possible. The Bidens and now Harris. My mother was a brilliant, five foot tall, brown woman with an accent. And as the eldest child, as the eldest child, I saw how the world would sometimes treat her. Founded 248 years ago, U.S. history could again be disrupted by the Democrats with the election of the first female U.S. president, the second it's nominated for the presidency, who's already broken barriers as the first female VP. What could the centuries-old political party have to teach us given the void left by Raila Odinga within Azimio as he seeks to elevate to the continental stage? I'm not going to be very active in Kenyan politics uh, henceforth. And amid the struggle of power within the ruling party. As I informed you earlier, I'm joined by Njeri Kabeberi, a governance expert, and she joins us virtually from somewhere in Nairobi. And we also have, I don't want to divulge too much, you know, security concerns and all. So, Njeri, uh, good to have you uh, with us, and thank you for taking the time to contribute to this conversation. Uh, we also have in studio Franklin Mukwanja, who is the Executive Director, Center for Multi-Party um, Democracy. Uh, Njeri, I'll start with you, uh, you know, sort of getting the highlights of the Democratic National Convention in the U.S., and I'm sure having come across clips or even taken the time to watch it, what were your thoughts? Uh, th thank you so much, Olivia. And uh, I just want to say it's a breath of fresh air to see people talking through history because that is what I saw during the DNC in the U.S., that everybody came out in support of the latest presidential candidate. Uh, if you look at our parties, the party ends as soon as the president leaves. And the biggest difference is that we don't have consistency, we don't have commitment to political parties, 
And that is not the history in the US. That's not the history even in South Africa, just uh, uh, within our own continent. They have very, very steady political parties. The ANC has been there over 100 years and takes really serious action uh, over candidates who don't toe the line. Uh, so Kenya has a long way to go in terms of our political system. And Frank knows we have really tried to put, to make political parties, real political parties, but somehow it keeps escaping us. Our political parties are parties of power. Actually, they're not parties. It's individuals who seek power using a name called a political party. And that is the difference between our parties, the South African parties, and now what we are seeing in the US. Very, very big difference. Over. All right, Frank, uh, do you mind if I call you Frank? Yeah, please, that's how I'm called. OK. <laughs> um, what, did you, what are your thoughts? What was the impression you got? I uh, first want to thank you for inviting me here. Um, I uh, felt three things. One is that uh, there is a great emphasis on a track record. Uh, who are you and where are you coming from? What's your background uh, that you're emerging from? And there was that a lot from family members, from uh, previous uh, colleagues, uh, you know, that you worked with, um, and, and even your seniors uh, in the party. And, and secondly is, uh, if you look at the transition from Biden to uh, Kamala, you realize that it's not just about structures, not just about strategies, not just about the people in those uh, structures and, and, and strategies but also a culture that has been cultivated over time, that there are some unwritten uh, but well acceptable uh, conventional norms that we have to follow in order to be able to institutionalize these things. And then you could see that there was an effort uh, in, in what uh, was being done, that the issue of having free and fair competitive process in an election to choose our public leaders presupposes uh, that we must have some uh, differences in opinions and interests. And, and there was that clarity coming in uh, from the, all the speakers across uh, the three, four days, uh, that, that setting themselves uh, worlds apart with the, the Republicans and, and, and Donald Trump. And, and that you could see from uh, the Obamas, uh, from the Clintons, uh, from all the speakers uh, that, that made the representations. And, and the big question, of course, that was hanging, that uh, Kamala Harris, uh, and still hanging on the head of Kamala Harris, is that what is her policy propositions on a range of issues, uh, because she's been uh, having a good ride and, and, and uh, the polls are favoring her, but she's not been very clear on her clear other than the abortion question on, 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 on several uh, policy propositions and, and the Republican Party has been pushing her towards that direction and you can see clearly that the whole idea is about we have a way of doing things over time and that is how they should be done. We have to ensure that there is a free fair process to uh, choose our public officials through an election and that has to be based on the social cleavages. What are the differences between the issues uh, that affect society and then what are the propositions that a candidate is bringing to the fore in terms of how they would govern uh, and, and, and I think that came out quite strongly in my view over the three four days. All right although she, she did try to strike a balance on several issues she came out in my opinion clearly on the Ukraine situation of course Russia for everybody in the US I suppose is the yeah. big bad. It is uh, just the beginning because uh, she still has wolf. to debate and test those ideas with the media. But with on the, on the Israel-Palestine issue yeah. she she did try to strike a balance. But Jerry, I wonder what do you make of how the Democrats handled that tension between uh, supporting uh, Biden uh, for a second term, while there was also a sense that perhaps he should leave it to somebody else. Uh, how that balance between democracy within the party, but also, uh, quote unquote, towing the party line. Um, it. it the action that Biden took, and I guess the party, but the, more so the presidential candidate, the president himself, reminded me of uh, our very own Nelson Mandela in South Africa, who gave up, he could have run for two terms, but he saw his role as creating the space 
for black leadership in South Africa. And when he had done that for four years, he vacated immediately. He didn't have to wait to compete because his role and his work was done. And I think this is also what Baden feels, that his work is done. And I think when you have a purpose, when you are president with a purpose, when you are a leader with a purpose, when your purpose is done, you don't have to stick to the seat anymore. And for me, I'm able to compare Biden and I'm, uh, with, with Mandela vacating a seat when your term is not due. It's not many political leaders who can do that. We can see Trump is trying to come back after being kicked out. He is trying to come back uh, rather than and at 78 years, rather than thinking, actually, I'm done. Let me allow somebody else to, to lead even within the Republican Party. So uh, I, I think once your purpose has been completed. You don't have to hang on to anything, whether it's a political seat, whether it is an office, or whether it is anything else that you have completed your work, just pull out and let others take over. That's what I say, that they are both, they, they, there's a good comparison there. But what lessons do you think they are from that for us as a country, Frank? Because, you know, there may be some dissent within the party, uh, but also you feel, or rather, you could be accused of undermining the same party if you voice maybe concerns or a divergent opinion. How do you manage that tension? The Kenyan situation is dire because what unites the political party stalwarts is not a common philosophy, it's not a common agenda other than the grabbing of power and, and the prestige for public visibility and opportunities for influence. The, if you look at the Democratic Party, the Democrats, they have a clear ideological inclination and that is what bonds them together. And therefore, having a negotiation and a discussion um, to ask Biden to step aside would not be an, a, a big issue because then they have ways and structures and ideas to do so. But I think more importantly, uh, for me it sounded more of a, a, a democrat strategy uh, than just uh, anything else. Uh, because the party stalwarts, to, in my view, and if you follow the discussion very well, uh, Barack Obama was being mentioned from a distance, and Nancy Pelosi was being mentioned from a distance, that they might have been tasked to handle the issue of the next presidential candidate. And, and, and that seemed to be a strategy, in my view, because the Republicans invested in the issue of Biden's age and frailties uh, as, as, as a campaign strategy. And you can see that the shift to Kamala has completely uh, thrown the Republicans into disarray. The other blunder that they did, they had a fixated mind on uh, people like Josh Shapiro for, 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 for the running mate, uh, who seemed to be having very strong um, views when it comes to uh, the Gaza issue, when it comes to the Ukraine issue, and that is what they wanted to really focus around and be able to campaign around. But then, uh, because of the party structures, because of the respect for the ideas that we share in common because of the respect for the party stalwarts and the influence that they have and the organs that they have within the party to handle this, then it became very easy that once Biden said, I am moving out, but I actually prefer uh, Kamala to come in, there was already the committee for searching for an appropriate running mate getting again the Trump team and the Republicans uh, flat foot. And there was already another team that was working to get the necessary grassroots networks and, and party support to be able to get to the convention from a united front. I, I say it's a strategy because if it wasn't, I think they would have arrived at the convention a little bit more confused without focus and having that as a center stage, like the Kenyan way, uh, to compete from different uh, perspectives. All right. Um, Jerry, we saw uh, the Clintons, we saw so the Obamas, we saw the Bidens, and we saw Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz. So you, you can sort of see through history how power has transitioned from one to the other to the other. We in Kenya, by contrast, although that is a party that has been in existence for close to two centuries, uh, in Kenya's case, political parties are viewed more as vehicles to attain power, as you noted in your initial remarks. What will it take for us to have more established parties uh, within which there is democracy? Um, thank you again, Olivia. 
And this is a big question that uh, the Center for Multiparty Democracy has tried to resolve where Frank works and where I worked before. Uh, and it was uh, create, curated purposefully to help political parties uh, have ideologies and be parties that uh, have a sustainable life rather than a short-lived life. And Frank, uh, I think we can jointly share this, that it, it, isn't, it hasn't worked that well for political parties. Uh, it seems to be very elusive, this uh, uh, sustainability of political parties in Kenya. And even some of the oldest parties, like Kanu, they seem to fade away. Uh, ODM, which of course it's orange. Orange was on orange, and orange, uh, orange, not orange the color. It was actually from the referendum that they <laughs> came up with the name of uh, orange. So you see, the 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 name that lead and that guide the political parties have no ideology themselves. Uh, you you can see through the values of the political parties when you hear them speak. When you see them, you don't see the structure of uh, governance within the parties. It is not loud enough for you to feel that you respect that political party. And that issue of ideology and values is why parties should exist. We should follow a political party because it calls for the values that we stand for. It calls for an ideology that we stand for. But in Kenya, it isn't like that. And just quickly to mention that some of the other parties that we have had an opportunity to witness are parties in Netherlands, parties in Denmark, and in other countries. And these parties, they recruit their people, the young ones, from high school. And therefore, this person grows into the party and grows believing in the party. In Kenya, as I say, the life is so short, we don't even have time to think about such a recruitment strategy. And therefore, uh, as soon as the presidential candidate, uh, as soon as they finish their term, the party dies off. Like Jubilee is soon going to die off. Uh, because, you know, uh, that is a history. That is a history that we have seen. Look at Kibaki's party. Uh, look at Kanu after Moy left. This has been the history of Kenya, and it's a sad history for political parties. And as I said, there have been efforts. I, I led that organization for 13 years. Frank has taken over. Frank, I don't know when we are going to win this battle of political parties, but it seems to be elusive in Kenya. Ideology and values, people just rush for power. And when that power ends, the party dies with them. Over. All right. Like, even in the United Kingdom, you know, the Labour, I mean, the Conservatives and, and um, the, what, what are they called? Liberals? Progressives? Yeah. 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 You, you, you never, they never ask themselves the question of, of who will take over. There's never quite a shortage of, of yeah. leadership in terms of who takes over as prime minister. But if you look at the Kenya situation, for example, if you looked at the paper today, so what does Raila's exit from the local political scene mean for Kenya's politics? You, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, and, and, and even you don't have to go to, all the way to the UK. Look at uh, down Tanzania, down south Tanzania, you'll see that the Chadema and CCM uh, with their own challenges as, as, a, as a republic, they, they have really held ground. Look at Ghana, uh, look at South Africa. We have real examples uh, to, to, look, to, to borrow from. And, and I, I want to mention several things and, and agree um, with my uh, senior, uh, Ngeri, that we have a long way to go. But I see uh, some light at the end of the tunnel with the, with, with the uprising of, of the young people uh, recently uh, terming the existing political parties as not good enough uh, for them, calling themselves partyless, uh, looking at the whole range of leaders and determining themselves as leaderless. And, and we need to find ways uh, to harness their energy and organize and mobilize them into proper political institutions. But to be able to do that, we have to continually entertain and encourage this uh, very healthy tension that has emerged from this uh, Gen Z uprising. A, a, a tension that is about uh, those that are beneficiaries of the prevalent um, obtaining, you know, uh, 
poor political culture that we have, a culture that is about um, you know, transactional politics, that is about looking at elected leaders as social welfare dispensers, uh, you know, a, a conversation uh, that is, is, is never about uh, what are the issues that you stand for, what are the values, as, as Njeri puts it, uh, and, and therefore what are your propositions to tackling these societal problems, to simply saying what do you have uh, to be able to, you know, as basic bad manners in our politics as voter bribery that is actually, uh, in fact, our, our corruption problem as a country is because of the behavior of corruption that is very prevalent in the political parties. But then we have in my view, even over legislated uh, in, when it comes to political parties. We have a good range of policy, uh, legal, and even constitutional framework for the political parties. But unless we renovate our p poor political culture, it is not going to be easy. But I can see that there is uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. Young people have to continue to put pressure so that this tension exists between those beneficiaries of the poor political culture and the constitutionalism uh, that demands that these institutions have to function in a particular way. We have to address the issue of money in politics, uh, which, is, which is a key thing. And I think deeper as we, we strengthen ourselves, we need to question continuously. Jubilee uh, governed this country for 10 years, and, and I'm speaking this uh, with a lot of hesitance because I, I serve them, and at the wrath of uh, they are looking at me uh, harshly, governed this country without internal party elections. Right? When you look at the UDA party uh, elections, they have all again fizzled out. Uh, ODM has uh, struggled about it, but it's, it's, it's difficult. I'm not saying that they are doing too badly. I'm only saying that it's difficult to run a political party. But then we must make attempts. A political party is not a, a civil society. It's not a corporate. It's not a, business, a private business. There are so many varying views that we have to put in mind. But then at the turn of internal party elections, which strengthens intra-party democratic systems, at the turn of party primaries, which really speaks, and, and political parties in Kenya must be ashamed of pointing fingers at IEBC when they cannot be able to deliberate their own internal issues in a better way. And of course, then in the longer run, we have to look at, uh, Olive, issues that are even deeper, is our electoral system design enabling uh, the development of our political parties. If it's first past the post, mm -hmm. combined with our poor culture, our patriarchy, our money domineering politics, you know, our ethno mobilization of politics, uh, enabling the, 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 the development of political parties. And finally, the issue of uh, the system of governance. We have given ourselves a a presidential system with minority and, and majority. Uh, what are the weaknesses and what are the strengths? It, would we do better with a Westminster type of democracy? Would we do better with a parliamentary, uh, you know, multi-party democracy? We must have this conversation in a way that we see how our political parties are going to develop. All right. I'll let that uh, press pause on the conversation for tonight. It's, of course, a conversation uh, that we can take much longer to dissect. But I want to thank you, Njeri Kabeberi, who has joined us uh, virtually. And thank you for your contribution uh, this evening. Thank you, Franklin Mukwanja, who is uh, CMD, Center for Multiparty Democracy, Kenya Executive Director. We take a break on that note, but keep it, Citizen Weekend, because there's plenty more coming up on the other side. <laughs>